Uh, I think this is my fourth time reading here at the store, which is great awesome institution of crime fiction in the United States. If you look all the way up on the top shelves, there's like first editions of everything ever. This place has got a lot of amazing books and great history. For me, going back to reading here in 2008, I think. Um, so a lot of good things. Uh, and thank you guys for coming. I'm gonna dedicate this reading to my wife, Kelly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> who's been going through a lot of crazy stuff with me as we've been navigating some things. <laughs> and uh, it's been really good. Any questions? We've got some nice folks here in the audience who may or may not be wondering things. Otherwise I can tell <laughs> ridiculous stories. I have a question about Jamie. your uh, your writing process. Yeah, so, <laughs> me too. Um, <laughs> tell me a little bit about how you write your first drafts and how you approach rewrites. That's a good question. Um, I think it's always changing. Like, there's no single answer that stays the same forever. Like, for each book, the process is different. It kind of has to teach teach you how it needs to be done for a given book. With this one. I had to step away from it for a long time, about two thirds of the way through, because my daughter was born. And so when I came back to it, I tried to make the first two thirds better and I sort of worked through that. And then I just really had to like, get some real momentum, like sprint to it and hit the end and just like, write until I got to the end. And uh, after that, I showed it to some people and got some feedback on it. And then I think after you've written a draft, then you can see what the book really has, like what the themes are and what's really going on. And and once you sort of have the ability to step back from it and get feedback from other people, then you can sort of make the themes all connect and the stuff go together. Um, one of the things that was happening with this book was that I, you know, it goes back and forth between chapters, uh, between the man and the woman. And initially I had it one, one, one. It was like back, every chapter was back and forth. And I, I gave it to a friend and then I sort of ran out of steam with the guy. And so I wasn't sure if I could keep doing a chapter with him every time. And so ultimately I ended up moving his chapters around a lot and changing their chronology a bit and then making them so there would be a couple of Donner chapters and then one of his. So with this one, I literally like had a file on my computer and I was moving chapters around in Scrivener and changing the order of everything a lot. And then like, you know, working on the, the themes and changing stuff and doing revision. Um, and then, you know, it went through developmental editing and copy editing and all the word stuff. Um, yeah, but with the one that I'm working on now, I've been trying to like revise through as I'm going, but I feel like at some point I need to just like blast through a first draft and then kind of make an outline of it to see what's there. And then I can revise for structure. So are you outlining before you're writing? No. You're just straight up writing. Yeah. I feel like the way that I understand the plot and the, where the plot comes from is the writing process. Mm. So like if I don't know what's going to happen, the way to figure it out is to sit there in the chair and figure out uh, all the events that I can get down in one given day. And I try to stop at a point where I know what's going to happen next, but only like this much. It's like driving at night with your headlights on in the fog. You can see this far ahead, but you can't see very far and you can still get to somewhere by doing that. So you're literally making up characters and defining their motivations right there in real time, having not thought about it at all before, just as you're putting pen to paper? Kind of. I mean, it's not every day that new characters are popping in, yeah. but yeah, new characters pop in. And then um, printer action over here. You guys getting a fax? Um, so yeah, I mean, some of this stuff winds up popping in as I'm doing the writing and then that's where in revision, I'll realize like, oh, this character changed somewhere between chapter three and chapter 60. So I need to change, fix that character and get it together or like mirroring the details. But yeah, like new things come up each day, like in the book that I was writing 
about the Jordans, it was like I finished a day knowing that the characters were in the elevator and the doors were going to open and they were going to knock on the door of this guy's hotel room. But I didn't know what was going to happen after the hotel room door opened. So the next day I get up, I write what happens when the guy opens the, like, I just know, like I have like five lines of like him opening the door and then whatever is going to happen next is just sort of invented from there. And I feel like that makes it more interesting as a writer because then I'm like the reader. I don't know what's going to happen. So it's exciting to find out. Yeah. And I feel like if I just tried to outline it all, it's like the idea that I would, I just need to sit with it for a long time to sort of generate it. If I tried to just do an outline in a couple of hours, it would be really hard to just come up with everything all ahead of time. Do you have a special place for writing or do yeah. you have rituals? And... <laughs> I do, I do. Yeah. In San Francisco, I had an office that I was renting outside of the house because we just didn't have room in our apartment. That was the first time I've done that. And that was kind of weird because it feels good to just be in the home and like you can sort of think about it and not think about it. In an office building, if you just start walking around the halls, people are like, what's going on with that guy? Or they want to talk <laughs> to you or like you just get in, involved in too many discussions. Like if I'm at home, I can just walk around a lot and not have to talk to people, which is good because it keeps my head sort of going. Um, so here in where I am now on the East Coast, I started out in the basement of the apart of the house and it was it used to be a man cave it has like boston red sox man cave stuff on it that's not mine and uh my daughter like immediately just start, started calling it the manhole when we moved in and she wasn't familiar with man cave but she'd heard of manhole so she's been calling it the manhole all the way through and so i was writing in the manhole for like three months and this room upstairs was like basically never used it was a guest bedroom and I had a bed in it. And I started to get a little bit depressed around December just because there was like this one window like above my head and that was the only light that was coming in and I was just staring at a wall all day in the basement. So then after we got back in January, I moved into the guest bedroom. The bed was gone, I put a desk in there and now I can look out of a real window and see trees and squirrels and stuff and <laughs> it's done a lot for my motivation and, and uh, my emotional stability and level my emotional level has really being above ground is big i can attest to that I mean, <laughs> in a lot of ways yeah. yeah and then i can paste stuff up on the wall and stuff like that that's good are there some themes where being in a dark place is a good thing as a writer hmm. well i mean the thing about writing really is that the um you know it doesn't happen soon or it doesn't happen quickly like it's all it's sort of like running a marathon or running a really long race it's all about sticking to it and sort of chipping away at something and so to do that in a basement yeah it just makes it harder to keep going back down there and now I go down there and it's like yeah of course I didn't like going down here all day every day um, and I've been teaching my classes down there now so I don't oh, use that's it where you sit all. yeah when you don't have to run up and do something with Willa. Right. Because, yeah. So she wakes up or the writing room is very close to my daughter's bedroom. So at night, I can't do my online classes in there. Yeah. If you were, I mean, that's a great question because if you were writing a story about a prison, right, maybe the dip basement would be the perfect place for you to get inspiration or something like that. I mean, do you, how, much, how much do the surroundings actually affect the tone of the book? I think the tone of the book is kind of what it is. I, I think that the tone of the book is what it is. Like the stuff in this book, like the thing about him getting bashed in the face with a sink is like not the darkest stuff in it. And there's darker stuff in there. I don't know where it came from. I don't want to walk around all day like Daniel Day-Lewis, like impersonate, <laughs> like embodying that and like personifying <laughs> that. Like, um, <clears throat> I mean, I really think like the emotional sort of even keelness and like staying upbeat about a process that really is about consistency and taking a long time is more important than like the method acting aspect of it and like really feeling that darkness and misery because like, yeah, so um, yeah, I feel like it's it's better not to be in a prison self imposed. Because really, it's just about like getting to the desk each day and doing that. And when you're by yourself and you're not getting like major accolades or checks or like uh, people patting you on the back and rubbing elbows and like making your coffee every day, 
or having coffee with you every day. Like it's about just getting back there and doing it. So yeah, I mean the emotional stability of it, the, the ability to, um, uh, to make it consistent, but also sort of make it sustainable so that you can keep doing it. That's what's really important. The sustainability of the practice. Without a dependency on your environment. Yeah, I mean, I, I court the dependency on coffee sometimes, yeah. and I think that's okay. <laughs> but yeah, I know. So yeah, I have a dependency on my environment in that like it has a window and like, <laughs> I am above ground. That's, yeah, it's big. Now, based on your other books, did you have kind of an idea what this one needed to be in terms of like duration, length, you know, what you were kind of going for? Not really. Um, you know, there's always like a general word count that I'm shooting for. Um, usually it's around 80,000. I think this one is right around there. Uh, but, and the one that I'm working on now, I have a goal of a hundred thousand, which is kind of arbitrary. Um, that stuff comes more from like what seems to make sense in a publishing environment. So it's kind of artificial. Um, but yeah, I mean, you have a sense that like you want to string a story along and keep it going for a really long time, long enough for it to be a novel. Excuse me. And you just, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what it was going to be about. I knew that I had these characters and they started talking. Um, I mean, this one was like a, a, I just wanted to get away from violence towards women. Like the last one in broad daylight was a serial killer with a guy hurting women. And I, I felt like at a certain point, like enough is enough with that. Like we see it all the time. I'm over it. I've seen it in movies and TV shows enough. So I wanted to have like a guy doing things to guys. And the thing with this book is that the police officer fantasizes herself about doing bad things to the same guys that this guy's killing because they're basically uh, beating up on hookers and like employing hookers and beating them up. So yeah, violence towards men. And the one that I'm writing now is like very steeped in... Uh, homelessness uh, in San Francisco. It's like the homeless problem in San Francisco is really pervasive now. And so that was a part of my life walking around the mission. And so that's a big part of the book. And then um, sort of the whole Black Lives Matter movement and uh, police brutality or police killing people and how that affects the community and how that affects police officers being able to do their job when the community is looking at them like, you guys are killers. And so I've, I've been working on this and like just in the middle of uh, the draft that I'm working on a couple of weeks ago, there was this thing on the Chronicle website, the San Francisco Chronicle, a guy was killed, a homeless person was killed by three police officers with guns like two weeks ago, three weeks ago, a block from, literally a block from our apartment on the, wa on the walk that I would go by every day to get to my office, there was like a bad block of homeless encampments. And these officers killed this guy who I've seen there a lot. And it, it was just really, so that sort of had to get into the book. Even though the police officers aren't killing homeless people in the book, like this guy got killed by police officers and the video of it is on the web. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Like they literally like the, are, like the, uh, the headline for the article was like, police kill homeless man less than 30 seconds after getting out of their car or less than 30 seconds after arriving on scene. And it's literally crazy to watch something like that. You right on the internet. Was? I've seen him. Like he's you the homeless him? guy who kicks the soccer ball against the, wow. I don't talk to him and I, he yeah, only speaks, you, you knew who he was. I think he only speaks Spanish. Yeah. Like, yeah, I could tell from the article who he was and my friend who lives right there was like, yeah, it's the soccer ball guy. Like he's never hurt anybody. And it's crazy. Like he had a knife. The police showed up because someone called them and they like totally, there was one guy with a shotgun and they walked right up on him and he started shooting. He shot four of the beanbag rounds, but literally like you can, like the other guy started shooting handguns with less than less, way less than five seconds after the other guy started shooting beanbag rounds. It's crazy for a guy with a knife who they were walking closer to. Anyway, there's been a bunch of stuff like that in San Francisco, and most of it doesn't get the national attention because it's Latino people. This guy was Latino, not black. Um, and they kind of all are there, except for this one that happened in Oakland in December. 
So it doesn't get as much national attention, but it's really bad and it really affects how the people in the city look at the police. So, you know, it's curious to think about like, how does this affect the everyday lives of the police officers who are trying to do a job? Is this draft from the perspective of the police? Yeah, it's the same character. Uh, the new draft is all her. There's no like alter alternative narrator. There's no popping around like that. It's all her and it's, yeah. What's the compare and contrast of this series versus the Jack you know, Palm series? The Jack Palm's one is more like mayhem and he's definitely like on both sides of the law. This one is more of a procedural kind of thing from the police point of view. In this one, she's kind of thinking about doing bad things, but she's not doing bad things. She's a police officer. Um, and then in the new one, it's really straight procedural. It's all her point of view. And um, there's Are we gonna find out a little bit more what she looks like? Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I don't really have a picture of her. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. I feel like she a lot has of brown that... hair. She's probably tallish because not she too plays tall. basketball. Yeah, there's something in there in the new yeah, one about I mean, how tall but, she is. Um, she's a short I gunner, mean, like this girl that was my research she's assistant. She's not African American mm -hmm. because she was having a kale and quinoa and salmon. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and African Americans well, never. I don't know. Kale. That was so specific. <laughs> that, that meal was so Brooklyn. specific that uh, <laughs> seemed to. Yet she's. Pals no, she's not African American, but her friend Ibaka is. Ibaka. And so they sort of bond and do their thing. Um, and she's white and she's from New York City and now lives in San Francisco and works in the same job as her father, but he never would have been okay with her working homicide. Right. Um, yeah, I'll work in more about what she looks like. But there's more in this one about like how tall she is, talking mm -hmm. more basketball. She's a shooter. Um, but right. like going back to the question, like it's similar to the in broad daylight one, which was a female FBI agent, but that was more like a federal level and sort of above reproach and less gritty. Cause that was in San Francisco and Alaska. Right. This one just felt like at a certain point I thought about making this one, the FBI character, just cause it, I thought maybe developing that series would be good. But the voice of this character, Claire Donner is so much more gritty and dark. It's just like a San Francisco, like dark, mean streets kind of thing. Um, I have a student in my class now who's reading it and he's like, is San Francisco really like this? <laughs> and in some ways, some parts of San Francisco are like this. Like our block is a great block and we live near five star restaurants that people line up for outside. But you can look outside of our apartment at 11 o'clock at night and there are hookers out there walking up and down right there. And it's like, you know, there is stuff going on in San Francisco that's really dark. And so I don't, it, this got into the book for whatever reason. So it, this one is darker than the Jack Palms and more procedural, uh, but less crazy stuff going on. But I still wanted to have some level of comedy in their rapport. Yeah. And how did you get started in uh, the mystery genre? Mm. Is it just being an avid fan? Did you start doing research? Well, back in my old workshop days, I was writing all literary stuff. I was doing a workshop with this guy, Jason, in New York City. I was writing the literary great American novel, On the Road, part 79, <laughs> with more drugs. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then I went through a really long phase of writing literary short stories. That was when I went through my graduate program. And then everyone basically said, you have to write a novel. And I struggled with writing a literary novel for some reason. And finally, it was just like, I just want to blow it out. Action, guns, drugs, see what happens. And I did that. And it just made it so much more fun to write. And the book had more energy and got a better response from people. So I've just been doing that ever since. And then I really started making sure to read everything in the genre and really getting a sense of where it came from. And I've taught a number of classes in uh, crime and mystery writing and in detective fiction as well in literature. Is there a book or a movie that sort of jump started all of this for you? So much, really. I think for a long time I was just trying to like keep a lid on all those influences because I wanted to be a big literary writer. 
And so, you know, so many things. The Sopranos, Dexter, The Wire, uh, Pulp Fiction, the movie, um, reading James Bond and uh, seeing James Bond movies, reading um, Sherlock Holmes as a kid and reading Encyclopedia Brown and all these different ones, you know, just forever. Like these things and video games, like playing all the video games, Grand Theft Auto, all this stuff. Um, yeah, like once I started to go for that, stuff really started coming in. Like there's a lot of stuff in the first book that sort of plays off of Scarface. This one has a character in it. The pimp character is, is very much drawn from a pimp character in True Romance, which I think is a great movie. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, so many different influences that just come up. Young Junius is basically the wire set in Cambridge in my junior high school years with like the bad kids from the wrong side of Cambridge in their projects. And yeah, it's just, you know, that stuff. So then guys like Richard Price reading him, uh, his book, The Whites is like right there and really good. You should buy it. It's a hardcover, right? Somewhere around there. And um, yeah. Richard Price, Raymond Chandler, all those guys, David Simon. Yeah, I mean, the thing in here about the thing where she says, um, are we okay for a time? Uh, pretty soon. Yeah, okay. So the thing where she says, like, it's a joke that I would file a complaint against him. There's this line in Homicide, which is nonfiction by David Simon, where he was with the Baltimore Homicide Police for a year, where, like, basically this guy got in trouble for coming in. Either he came in late or he didn't show up to work one day and the boss like got pissed at him and was like, you can't just not, I mean, these guys are, are working overtime, ridiculous hours cause they're at a crime scene and then they go home and try to sleep at like five in the morning. So the boss was like, you have to fill out paperwork for that day that you missed. Like we have new, new rules now you have to fill out the forms. And so he like printed out the form and wrote in it, I couldn't come to work that day because a German U-boat was parked in my driveway and I couldn't get my car out and just submitted it. And it was like, there was nothing that they could do. He knew that it was totally <laughs> stupid that he was filling out the form. So yeah, like the idea of paperwork is sort of funny and you get stuff like that from these, from reading. Are your books going to move to the mean streets of the Berkshires? <laughs> it's not the Berkshires. <laughs> Springfield. It's the Pioneer Valley. Mm. East Happy Valley. We have a love story. Yeah. No, I don't know. I definitely am writing. The one that I'm writing now in San Francisco, I think I want to keep this story in San Francisco for a while. Actually, Claire, uh, Jess Harding is from the Berkshires originally, the character in the FBI book. She's from the Berkshires. So maybe she could go back to Great Barrington and do something. I don't know. There are writers who write this like rural setting stuff, and that's not me. Mm -hmm. definitely not for now but i worry like if i live there for a while am i going to go soft and start <laughs> writing about like the raccoons who are stealing stuff out of the garbage dumpster <laughs> behind the piggly wiggly <laughs> i don't know it's scary but there's also a lot going on with uh, a really exciting series of children's stories that we've been working on nice. with our daughter mm. the skaboo chronology and the skaboo chronicles mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big stuff going on there. Yeah, There's a magic fortunate. cave that Mole showed them. <laughs> really big. So, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. But for now, I'm sticking with Clara Donner in San Francisco. Okay. Good. Thanks again for coming, everybody. Uh, I'd love to sign some books and drink some beer and stuff. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks, Zach. <laughs> Thanks for videoing, Kelly. Yeah, we'll put this on the internet. <laughs>